Well, good morning, everyone. And what a great day. What a great day to be out. And, and make sure you take a walk and with your pet, which might be your husband or your wife. So today's the day to, to get out and walk around a little bit and tomorrow. And then we're back in a typical March weather. So that said, you know, today's topic, in fact, March, you know, March is the, the month in which Washington decamped or left Mount Vernon. So I thought today we would talk about a little bit about, I gotta get comfortable, a little bit or a lot of it about the American Revolution and the, the terrible winter at Valley Forge. And, and Valley Forge was the second, the second winter of the American Revolution. And just to back up for a moment, there was nothing inevitable at all about the American Revolution. It, it should have been resolved diplomatically, but it wasn't. Uh, on either side of the Atlantic, there was the need to clear things up. And what surprises me still is there's such an interest in the royal family. Who cares? Frankly, who cares? They're living off the British taxpayers. So that said, and that shows my, you know, how I feel about that. And, uh, you know, just leave it alone. I mean, who, who gives a, a rat about it? All right, so that, that said, and that there was nothing inevitable about the American Revolution, and yet it came to be, and it came to be with, you know, through the Boston Massacre. I'm not sure we've talked about that. You know, maybe someday we can. And, and also with the events at, at Bunker Hill and Lexington and Concord and, and Great Britain, not Great Britain, George Washington being appointed commander of the Continental Army, which he accepted reluctantly, but he accepted, and then he made his way to Cambridge. And when Washington knew, and I need to share this with you, that being appointed commander of the Continental Army, uh, he was a one-man army. There was no one else in the army except him. And when he made his way to Cambridge to, to try to bring some order and discipline you know, to these Minutemen who would chase the British down from Concord through Lexington and now into Boston, and he met the militia that had done so, he was aghast that these men were poorly trained, poorly clothed, that they stayed up all night drinking, playing cards, you know, raided the farms in and around Cambridge to get something to eat. So this was an army, you know, that I'm going to defeat one of the most professional armies in the world. This is what I have to work with. So that said, that the, he was able to chase you know, the British out of, he was able to chase the British out of Boston. General Gage left. And by the way, we have a little bit of biological war going on here that when Bostonians died of whatever, dysentery or whatever, in, in Boston, that what Gage would do is he would hurl the bodies by catapult, you know, into the American lines. How about that? And, and the colonials would do the very same thing. And what Washington did talk about dealing with a virus or a medical condition, he insisted that all of his soldiers be inoculated. So we, you know, Rose and I were just talking about the frustration of making an appointment, you know, to get even the first shot, you know, never mind the backup shot. So let's move along from there. So Gage left and, you know, made his way up to Halifax and, and that Lord General Howe, you know, and his brother Admiral Howe were dispatched to to New York to confront Washington's army, such as it was. And even Washington believed that the war would be over in one single engagement, you know, somewhere in New York. So when the British evacuated Boston, that Washington gathered up his army, such as it was, and made his way to New York to confront the British, and it will be over in one major engagement. And he felt that it would be around December that the, the war would be broken off, uh, negotiations completed, and America would be independent. Well, what Washington found out during the war is that the, he really led a coalition of 13 nations, 13 colonies, contributing their militia you know, to the effort against the British. And events did not work out in New York as Washington had anticipated. And General Howe chased 
Washington, out of New York, across to New Jersey, he in the Philadelphia, and and General Howe was willing to accept Washington's surrender, but Washington did not want to surrender. He crossed the Delaware in these makeshift ore boats and and raided the the Hessians at Princeton and at you know and and, and got their supplies. And in that first winter, see the 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 experience had been or the tactic had been in, in Europe and was brought to the to the colonies as well, is that there would be a a timeout during the winter. You know, that the armies would not fight, you know, during the winter. They would go into a winter encampment, rest up, get re equipped, accept volunteers, or maybe some would leave and get ready for and get ready for the spring offensive. So when Washington made his way toward Philadelphia in the late fall of seventeen seventy seven, you know, into seventeen seventy eight, when Washington made his way toward Philadelphia, Howe had captured Philadelphia and back then Capturing the capital of a nation was seen as a victory. They had no option but to resign. So when Washington made his way, I'm pretending this is my war map, if you let me do that. <laughs> when Washington made his way toward Philadelphia, the, the Continental Congress fled. Howe captured Philadelphia, and Washington made his way toward Philadelphia in a futile attempt to try to defend the capital. The Continental Congress left, they fled, is a better word, and when Washington confronted Howe in, in front of Philadelphia, he was swept to fly, uh, swept away like a fly, and at the battles of Germantown and Brandywine, Washington fled, Howe made his way uh, for his winter encroachment, his winter quarters for Philadelphia, and, and what Washington did is he fled, he trudged to Valley Forge not as an army to, to fight the British. It was winter, you see, the going into winter quarters. He fought the British. He, with about maybe 12 or 13,000 men, you know, that he, that he saw himself as an army of, of observation to keep an eye on the British, you know, and, and where they might be going once the winter passed, and also to provide some protection for the farmers in and around the Philadelphia area. Uh, that proved to be uh, difficult to do. I'll come right back to that. The army, you know, that trudged into Philadelphia was broken. Uh, they were hungry, and they, they were starving, and they had no quarters to speak of. The, if you go to Valley Forge today, by the way, there is no valley at Valley Forge. I mean, there are forges because it had been an ironwork center, you know, but there is no valley at Valley Forge, and when he went into Valley Forge, his army had expanded a little bit. It was looking better for the, you know, for the for the American cause, but he had far more men with him when he went into Valley Forge than when he went into the first winter encampment, and and he was able to feed that army from the supplies, you know, gathered at, at Princeton and Trenton, but making his way to Valley Forge. He did not have those supplies any longer, and the men of Valley Forge hungered. Uh, they began to starve to death. That winter was not as bad as one would think it was if, if one reads the textbooks. And by the way, in, in reading the textbooks, you know, one would think that all Americans, all colonials supported the, the American Revolution. They did not. Even, even John Adams, and he got the number wrong. I think it was too generous. John Adams, long after the war, maintained that a third of the colonial support of the war, that a third remained indifferent, and a third remained neutral. You know, they, they remained loyalists. And I think John Adams was being too generous. I think about 20% of the colonial support of the war. And, and most of them hoped that it would simply blow by, that it would be over and we get back on good relations with king and country. That did not happen. At Valley Forge, Washington suffered or endured far more deaths, 2,500 deaths, than he did in any other battle during the American Revolution. 
and at Valley Forge there was no battle. The colonials at Valley Forge died of diseases. They died of exposure. They died of, they, they died of dehydration. Washington lost about 2,500, 3,000 men at Valley Forge, and there wasn't a single bullet fired by the British Army. So as Washington trudged into Valley Forge, very low on supplies, and, and the orders of the day from Washington you know, were to build an encampment, you know, sheds, to, uh, fireplaces, to be able to hide out until the spring came and the war could begin again. But as the soldier said, we have no wood, we have no nails, we have no hammers. Uh, how are we to build winter quarters when we had nothing to, to use to build winter quarters? And as Lafayette said, that we dug what he called dungeon cells. We dug into the earth and we built fires and it was smoky, there was no food yet, and it was smoky, it was uncomfortable, and Washington, seeing the number of death, ordered that the hospitals be constructed on the outskirts of Valley Forge and the deaths be, be buried off campus, if you will, because that will be a morale buster if the soldiers see all of their comrades dying of medical conditions. So they're buried off campus, off campus, off the battlefield. And when one visits Valley Forge today, and if you get a chance, you ought to, it doesn't look at all as it, as it appeared in 1778. There are nice huts, uh, they're well painted. Uh, it's almost a place for a honeymoon. I almost want to say, you know, with, with uh, air conditioning and so forth. What happened in the 1930s is that at Valley Forge, with Roosevelt's New Deal, they refurnished the entire campsite, you know, to bring it up to speed. And now, as I said, it looks like a the National Fields and Park Service maintains Valley Forge, and it looks inviting. It looks comfortable. Not so in that second winter. And, and the men were starving, and they were dying, and some were deserting. That General Howe, you know, made it clear, because men were passing in between lines. Uh, Valley Forge was only 13 or 14 miles away from Philadelphia, and Howe was simply waiting for the weather to clear and that he would attack Washington at, at Valley Forge. I'll get back to that in, in a while. The men were starving. They had nothing to eat. And the quartermaster, and you know that a quartermaster today is in charge of supplying the army with supplies, with boots, with helmets, with weapons, and so on and so forth, tents, and so on and so forth. So the first quartermaster of the Continental Army was a man by the name of Thomas Mifflin. He wasn't very good at his job at all. He could not provide Washington with very little. And the, and the little, the very little that I just described it, the very little he was able to get barrels, commandeer barrels from the farmers in the area. And he could only pay with Continental currency. You might remember from going to school, or the phrase today, some people use it, not worth a continental, you know, which means your money is worthless. It's like monopoly money. And Washington could only issue Mifflin continental currency, which was worthless, not worth a continental. The farmers would not accept it. The British paid a gold. The farmers were quite willing to sell whatever they had to the British quartermaster. I'll mention his name in a moment. Well, I will right now. His, his name was Loring, General Loring. So Mifflin you know, would go to the farmers, and these farmers, they, they weren't all loyal at all. Most Americans did not support the revolution. As I said, if you read the history books, it downplays that. So Mifflin would go, and what he would bring back in the, his first haul, if you will, of food for the soldiers were barrels of flour, big barrels of flour, but they weren't filled with flour when they pried open the tops of the barrels, the first inch or so was flour. The rest was sand to give the barrels heft to make it appear as they were filled with flour so the men at least could have bread to eat. So the little bread, the little flour they had initially, and, and Washington, and he did, he will fire Mifflin, 
and then fill his position from Nathaniel Green from Rhode Island, who didn't want the job. You know, he wanted to be a, so, a fighting soldier. He'll get that opportunity later. So what was done before Nathaniel Green could bring meat and, and good food supplies into the ranks of Valley Forge is the men made fire cake. It's called fire cake. It filled you nicely. It filled up your stomach. It was hard to pass. It filled you up literally. Fire cake, fire cake. And today, tonight, that you, if you're in charge of making meals, that you can offer the family fire cake. And all it is is flour with a little bit of water together, like a patty cake. You turn it into a little patty cake, and you put it into a fire, and you let it brown. And that became your breakfast, your lunch, and your dinner. Now, it had very little nutritional value, but it would fill you up. So tonight, if you want to present a surprise dinner, make fire cake. And this is what the soldiers ate during the American Revolution. Be brave. Be a militiaman. Be a soldier. Now, that didn't that didn't satisfy Washington and certainly did not satisfy the, the hunger. All they did was get filled up with fire cake. It filled you, but that's about all that it did. And the chant for the men, meat, 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 we want meat. So this is where Mifflin is relieved of command and General Nathaniel Green is told by Washington to go into the countryside. Now remember, most farmers in the area of Philadelphia did not support the revolution. They paid in, the British came, and they paid in gold. And that was good currency then, and it is today as well. So Nathaniel Green was told by Washington to go into the, go into the homesteads, go into the farms in the Philadelphia area, and take, hear me well, take what you need. Offer them bonus money, not bonus money, off the monopoly money, and tell them when the war is over and we are successful, we will make sure that you are paid. So give them IOUs. And the farmers did not want them. And Green was told by Washington, take what you need. This army is falling apart. In fact, Washington, you know, sent a note to the, to, to the Continental Army, I mean, to the Continental Congress, he's, he sent a note. You know, if you do not help us somehow, that this army is going to disperse, I cannot keep it together. And what they said back to him is do what you need to do to hold the army together to keep the cause of alive. So Washington's instructions to the new quartermaster, Nathaniel Green, was to go into the countryside and tell the farmers, here's an IOU. And, and then take what you need. Go into their barns, go into the fields, go into the woods where they were hiding their pigs, cattle, and horses, and take it. Take it for the cause. And leave the Philadelphia farmers with an IOU signed by me. You have my permission to do this. This army is falling apart. It is dispersing. And Washington knew that there were hundreds who were deserting. You see, the these campsites were only 10, 12, 13 miles apart. So there was much movement, you know, between the two camps. And how, you know, sending spies to Mount Vernon and the word going to Mount Vernon that if you slip away at night, just slip away at night with two or three or four colleagues, comrades, slip away at night and make your way into Philadelphia, you'll get food, wine, lodging, a hot fire, and there are women available. Uh, hold the name of Elizabeth Loring behind your left ear. That's my left ear, I know that. Elizabeth Loring. And there ought to be a statue to her at Mount Vernon. I'll tell you why shortly. Slip into, as How said, slip into Philadelphia. You know, there'll be no reprisals, there'll be no hangings, there'll be no firing squads, but there will be food, there'll be lodgings, there'll be a hot fire and wine and whatever else is available. And there'll be a bonus, you know, that I will give you gold if you slip in to Philadelphia and diminish the amount of forces Washington has at Philadelphia. Now, 
What does Hal want from them in return? Very little. All I want from you is intelligence. What's the morale like at Valley Forge? How many men have left? What is the level of sickness? How many men are in the hospital? How weak has Washington become? So that I will know in the spring, late March, early April, when it begins to clear, like it has outside today and tomorrow, you know, that I will plan my attack. I will encircle Washington's army, and that will be the end of the revolution. It will be over in another six months or so. All I want from you is information. So the men deserted. I mean, Washington would get up in the morning. There's another tent full of men gone, another and another and another. There was starvation. There was hunger. It appeared as if the whole thing was over, that it was a fool's errand to fight one of the mightiest armies in the world. Washington was in a tough spot, and he knew it. He knew it. This army is falling apart, and that's why I've sent Nathaniel Green out in the countryside to gather food. And this was the first, I'll give you two more, one of the first breakthroughs for the, for the army, to be able for Washington to keep the army together. As I said, it looked like it was a fool's errand. See, initially, you know, when, when the, when the, I'm backing up a moment, when the men left Cambridge to make their way to New York to have the only battle of the American Revolution, it was called, and this is a French term, it was called the Rage Militaire. Everybody, every young man, every older man wanted to join the army. You know, as it, as it marched from Boston, Cambridge, you know, into, into New York, because it was warm. You know, the weather was warm, the roads were dry, there was no, they had boots, there was no rain, the women came out and, and cheered them on and gave them a little kiss on the cheek and put flowers around their, you know, around their necks and gave them a little bite to eat. This was fun. There's no danger here. This is fun. Then the rains came and the hunger came and the British sent the largest army they had ever sent anywhere overseas in the history of Great Britain, commanded by General Howe and his brother Admiral Howe. And they were expected by, by the king and Lord North to disperse this and crush it quickly. Didn't happen that way. See, we know that, but they didn't know that. All the cards were not turned over. And it was a long shot, a long shot. So the rage militaire faded with rain, and when the army showed up with bayonets, muskets, and with cannon, and they fired to kill, we are going to crush this revolution. A little bit of a side note. I just said a moment ago that this is the largest army that Britain sent anywhere in the history of the Commonwealth until World War II. How about that? Until World War II when Montgomery, General Montgomery, George Eisenhower in not George, Dwight Eisenhower in New York to kick out Patton from, not from, uh, from North Africa, rather. So hold that thought as well. So here's Washington trying to feed his army and to provide meat, you know, rather than fire cake. Their, uh, their housing was terrible. Lafayette called them caves, digging into the side of the hill. And again, the, the smoke, the, 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 the disease, the lack of food, it was desperate. And, and Howe is waiting for warmer weather to evacuate Philadelphia, to get out of winter quarters and make the assault on Washington and what was left of the army. So here's one turning point. Valley Forge is a turning point in the American Revolution and it has three phases. One is Nathaniel Green was able to feed the army or to help feed the army and to diminish the number of desertions. And the second, and this doesn't get enough play, at least in my book, when I write that history book, and I shall with two or three companions, I want to give a tip of the hat to General von Steuben, S-T-E-U-B-E-N. Von Steuben was a Prussian. He was a German. And there wasn't a whole lot of work to do, and he was bored. You know, he was looking for some excitement. And Benjamin Franklin, by now Benjamin Franklin, had been sent to France to see if he could stir up French resistance against the British and to get French help. 
I'll come back to that. That's important. And so he meets with Benjamin Franklin and von Steuben through an interpreter, of course, schmoozes Franklin, you know, congratulating him on his science, on the number of inventions. And Benjamin Franklin is open to be stroked, you know, to be uh, congratulated. We all are, aren't we? You did a, a wonderful job. And, and Franklin was taken with Steuben. What Steuben wanted from Franklin is he wanted a commission in the Continental Army. There was no work to be done. And he's a soldier, he's a fighter, and he wanted to be on the front line. Von Steuben was a drill master in the Prussian Army. And, and Franklin listened to this, and he said, we need professional soldiers. You know, we've, we've got a, you know, a group of very unprofessional soldiers that are being led by, as it stands now, by the you know, local storekeeper or the local minister. They know nothing about battlefield tactics. So you want a commission. I'll tell you what I can do for you. I cannot grant you a commission because I don't have that authority from the Continental Congress. But what I can do for you, I can let, right, this works so often today, that I can recommend you. I can write a letter of recommendation for you to present to the Continental Congress, who I hope will commission you in the Continental Army. So Benjamin Franklin is, you know, through an interpreter, obviously. Uh, I, what have you done lately? And, and it was pretty thin. There was nothing that was happening. And, and Franklin said, we've got to juice up this resume. We do it today, don't we? We need to juice up this resume. And I'm going to say in this resume, this general letter of recommendation, that you sat at the shoulder, you sat at the right elbow of the, of the King of Prussia, and you helped him plan battles. And Steuben, I did? I didn't do that. Oh, but you will in this resume. And not only that, that you are a commander, that you, you are a general in the Prussian army. I am, I was, you are now. And I'm going to really juice up this resume. And, and you will get your appointment. We need field officers that are trained. So Franklin gets his letter, tucks it in his pocket, and boards a ship to make his way to, to Philadelphia or wherever the capital is. But he, he contracts typhoid on the way. And by the time he arrives in Philadelphia, he's dying. He's dying. Many, many contracted typhoid on the way over. It was everywhere, by the way. Death was everywhere in colonial America, you know, in, in the early years. And so when they brought him ashore on a stretcher, you know, who is this guy? Who's this fat guy? Well, nobody knew who he was, so they're going through his clothing, you know, to give this guy an identity, and somebody pulls out the letter of recommendation that saved Franklin's life. And they read the letter and said, this guy is important. So he was eventually, when he recovered, to get his commission. You are to report to Valley Forge. I don't want to report to Valley Forge. It's a losing proposition. You, sir, I'd report to Valley Forge, and your job, your mission, is to train Washington's army and to professionalize Washington's army, to turn it into an army that knows how to attack, knows how to retreat, and knows how to deal with the British. So von Steuben goes to Valley Forge, and what he does, and this is the best way to think about it, so when you write this down, underline it, it will be on the test. There's a test, you know. I mean, there will be a final exam, you know, come June. I'll give you the blue books. Rhodes will hand out the blue books. And you remember the blue books? We still use them today. They are, they're essential. It's part of going to college, you see. And you are to professionalize my army, to teach them how to drill, to, to teach them how to retreat, how to fire in ranks. And by that I mean, we've all seen this in the, you know, in the movies where, where one line all right, this will be the first line. A rifleman will fire, and then they retreat back through the other. The ranks will move apart, and they will retreat back and reload. And then the second line will fire, and they'll retreat the third line, the fourth line, fifth line. And by the time the fifth line is fired, that first line has reloaded and move up through the ranks and fire. A rolling sequence of fire, just like they do in Prussia, in Germany, in France. 
He professionalized them, taught them how to drill. Did a good job, by the way. You know, Washington was very pleased. And when that army left Mount Vernon in March of 1778, they were prepared that they knew how to read a, a flag. You know, they could take orders. And as, this is great, this is so American, as von Steuben said, you have good men here. Of course, it's going through translation. You have good men here. These are good lads. The only thing they need to learn is follow orders. In Prussia, when you teach a lad to do this, they do it. You, you American lads, you American boys want to be told why we do it this way and not that way. They're good men. They're good soldiers. They just want to know why. In Prussia, these men obey. They don't ask why. They just do it. And again, the phrase is he professionalized the Continental Army and turned them into an army, into a functioning army when they left Mount Vernon late in March of of 1778. Now, at the end of the revolution, um, Steuben has not returned to Prussia. It's not Germany yet. He's not returned to Prussia. He's granted American citizenship. Not too many people have been granted a honorary American citizenship. Lafayette was. Uh, Churchill was. And I can't think of any others offhand. And also, the state of New York awarded him thousands of acres in upstate New York to, to farm to settle in and to have a life in a nation, you know, that he helped to create. Now, the third item, you know, so we've got the army fed somewhat, and Nathaniel Green. Uh, we have professional, actually there are four. We have them professionalized, von Steuben, the Americans, and a third one, I have a fourth one coming, a don't let me forget it, Rose, all right? All right? <laughs> Just say the word to, well, I'll, I'll remember. Uh, I get paid for my memory. The third one is in, you know, in winter quarters, many of the officers simply took up with the ladies. The officers were the source of entertainment. They were the source of money. Uh, they were the source of influence. The capital is being occupied by the British Army, by the British officers. And General Howe, <laughs> What's the I know this is a family show. General Howe, and this is not what happened, fell in love with Elizabeth Loring. Actually, she was a professional whore. And, uh, and Elizabeth Loring was a leggy blonde, but she was married. See, that sometimes is a problem. You know, it, that sometimes is a problem, you know, even the colonial period, that she's married. Now, I gotta get rid of her husband. So how do I get rid of her husband so that he allows me to go out, you know, and to, and to date, to have dinner, to dance with uh, Mrs. Loring. And she'll take care of me and I'll take care of Mr. Loring. So Mr. Loring, L-O-R-I-N-G, Mr. Loring was appointed the quartermaster of the British Army. And he was given barrels of gold to go out into the countryside and buy hay, buy horses, buy foodstuffs for the army that's living in Philadelphia. They need to be fed or I'm gonna have trouble. That's why I'm getting deserters from Mount Vernon. Now in return for this, two things. I'd like your permission to be able to date, if you will, to use a modern term, to go out with your wife. She's absolutely gorgeous. And in return for that, I'll make you the gorgeous, that's not a term that we use in the 21st century, attractive, appealing, I'm sure there are other words, but this is a family show. And I will make you the quartermaster general, and I'll give you sacks of gold. And you go out into the countryside, and you make a deal with the farmers out there for horses, pigs, cattle, for hay, and so forth. Now you make a good bargain, and whatever you keep in that barrel, whatever is left in that barrel, after you bargain with these soldiers, is yours. And in return for that, I can go out with your wife. And so that's the deal. I've always maintained, and it's not there, I've always maintained that there, was, there should be a statue to Elizabeth Loring. She kept Howe in Philadelphia and not attack Washington prematurely. And, uh, and the family made money. 
Now the fourth item, and and this was very personal for Washington. You know, he also he almost lost command of his army. You see, he had been he had been unable to protect New York. He had been able to he had been unable to protect Philadelphia. He had been swept aside at at Brandywine in Germantown and shoved across the the uh, the Delaware and now was, if you will, losing the war on the outskirts of Valley Forge. General Horatio Gates. Washington knew General Horatio Gates. He had served with Gates in the Seven Years' War, and he liked him. And Gates liked Washington. But you see, the way the British Army operated is that in order to get a promotion, you need to have influence. You need to know people. You need to have cash. And Gates did not have cash, and he was a man of very little influence, and he was not able to raise or to rise above the rank of major. Now, back then, you could sell your rank. No one would buy his rank. No one would want to be a major. It would be like me selling my PhD. You can't do that, you know, I don't think. I should check into that. Maybe, maybe I could make some money. But back in, you know, back in Europe, certainly back in England, you sold your rank. Nobody wanted this rank. And Washington knew him from the Seven Years' War. So, you know, Gates took off. He crossed the Atlantic, went to Virginia, and bought land in Virginia, and was, was successful. As the American Revolution broke out, Gates asked Washington for a command. Now, Gates was a trained officer, and Washington, we need officers. So he gave Gates a command. He gave Gates a command up in the northern area, the New York Can Can Canadian area. And the British attacked through Canada, and they, they had Gates surrounded. The man who saved the day for Gates was Benedict Arnold at... Um, at, at the Battle of Saratoga. Arnold was again wounded, and Arnold was not given any... He was not given... He, he was not seeing as being the day as the man who carried the day for Gates. That's not the way Gates saw it. And Gates sent a letter to the Continental Congress. It's called an after-action report. You know, if you're in the Army today, if you're in the Army at any time, and you engage the enemy, you, you file with your superior officers, and after action report, what happened, why, how many men were lost, how many casualties did you inflict? Even police officers have an after action report. It's not as extensive as a general in the United States Army. Nonetheless, it's an after action report. So Gates sent a letter to the Continental Congress in which he patted himself on the back for defeating the British and the Hessians at the Battle, pardon me, at the Battle of Saratoga, made no mention of Benedict Arnold, and this further defeated the cause for Benedict Arnold, and that's one reason, among others, but one reason, you know, why he, why he will desert the American cause and join the British, and try to sell the defenses of West Point. You know, maybe someday we can talk about that if we all live long enough. I've got so much to share with you. I don't know if I'll live long enough to talk into that camera, or you'll live long enough to, um, you know, to listen to the storyline. So Gates, take, Gates takes full, not responsibility, but full credit for the victory at Saratoga. Benedict Arnold is ignored, and, and again, that is part of one of the reasons why he commits treason, if you will. And Gates makes the observation in that letter, and they all knew this, that Washington had been unable to defend New York, that he had been unable to defend the Capitol, and maybe it's time to replace him. He doesn't have the nerve. He doesn't have, what well, you want to say, chutzpah. You know, he doesn't have the nerve. He doesn't have the courage. I do. I want his job. I can command the Continental Army. Now, from Washington's point of view, this is my neighbor. This is a guy that I gave a command to. This is a guy that I bailed out when he came to Virginia and really had no prospects. 
and now he wants my job. That's the rumor I'm hearing. And so Gates is, for the most part, from Washington, dismissed. I want nothing to do with this man. So we have Nathaniel Green, we have Mrs. Loring, uh, you know, we have we have Gates trying to take the command, even from Washington, even John Adams was disappointed in Washington's behavior and, and a, a lack of success. So there was a an attempt to remove him, which fails. You know, Washington caught on to it. And, and Washington was a, he didn't have, well, he had a temper, but he was able to keep it in check. But here's a man who I rescued, and he's trying to take my job, and nothing is going our way. And I have sent a letter to the Continental Congress before it dispersed up to Lancaster, in which I wrote to them that unable, un, unless you supply me, this army is going to break up. We've lost the cause. As I said, they sent a letter to him. We can't help you. We're on the run. Need, do what you need to do. We'll back you. And that's when he began to give IOUs to, to the farmers. You know, as I said a little while ago, that most Americans either were indifferent to the revolution or remained loyal to king and country. And they kept two flags in the, by, the, by, by the front door. And if the British were in the area, they would fly the British flag to make sure that their homes were not invaded or burnt to the ground. The, uh, the British were very fond of burning. Uh, they burnt a, a great deal of Lexington on their retreat through Concord, Lexington, and back to Cambridge. That was at the start of our story. And <clears throat> if the Continental Army was in the area, they would keep a flag of the Continental Army to prevent the Continental Army from coming to their home and sacking it. So it depended on who was in the area. So, you know, it's a messy affair. All you need to do is read a chapter on the American Revolution, and you'll find, if you believe me, and you ought to, you'll find where the revolution is covered in a textbook, and there are very few textbooks out there today. Most kids are working online. Now, the story isn't told as cryptically and as, as told as what if, and that we've talked about it today. Uh, this morning. So Washington saves his, his army and in the spring in the spring he slips away from General Howe and what he does, Washington, what he does is he pulls a fast one on General Howe as we are going to break encampment early and we are going to march out of the Valley Forge area early so that Howe doesn't have a chance or an opportunity to surround me and prevent me from, from breaking out. So what Washington orders is that he orders his, his men to build enormous bonfires around Valley Forge to make it appear as if the men were getting ready for and get into their tents, were getting warm, were roasting their meat, if you will, their, you know, their lamb, if you will, and keep those fires burning when, when nighttime comes, to make it look like we're still here. Keep those fires roaring. And they did. And how, you know, uh, they're still up there. They're still up there. Uh, Elizabeth, would you like to go out to dinner tonight? Well, I would, General. And we'll do a little dancing? Of course, General. You are a brilliant dancer, and you lead so well. You make me look so graceful on the dance floor. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, you make me look good as well. We all know that, don't we? A good lead dancer can make the other person look real good. You know, just follow my steps. I'll make you look better than you are. You know that. Mm -hmm. And sometimes a woman will say that to the guy, <laughs> or the guy will say that to the, uh, you know, to the woman. So, uh, they're in there for the night. We'll have, we'll have another night together. Ah, perfect, General. Let me slip into something a little more graceful, maybe something off the shoulder. Oh, yes, Elizabeth, please, something off the shoulder. I want the men to see how graceful and how beautiful you are. So every night it looked as if Washington 
was still up there. What he was doing is soldier by soldier by soldier as he was retreating. He was moving away from Mount Vernon. So when the roads cleared and the weather warmed a little bit, you know, we can skedaddle out of here. That's a word that was used in the 17th and 18th century. We can skedaddle out of here. So one night, or for a few nights, there were no fires. And, and General Howe, you know, would tell his, his officers, get up there, get up there and see what's going on. So they've left. What do you mean they've left? They've left. They've, they've skedaddled down the back of, of Valley Forge. They've left. Where are they going? We don't know. You know, we have to find them. So, you know, General Howe is very embarrassed that Washington got away from him. And what he does is he moves, he, he goes back to England and he leaves another man in charge to see, to, to find Washington and where that bedraggled Continental Army has retreated to. And over time, you know, that story gets told and retold. You know, I don't want to get into all of that. So this is an important victory. Maybe not even a victory. You know, they, they went into, he was able to hold his own. We haven't been defeated. We're able to fight another day. We'll regroup, we'll resupply, and we'll get ready to fight another day. And that other day comes, finally. How is it around anymore? Uh, that other day will come at the at Yorktown, at the Battle of Yorktown in Virginia, where General Cornwallis retreats to the peninsula of Yorktown. Now Yorktown was a sleepy tobacco town, and Cornwallis wants no part of retreating to Yorktown because Yorktown is a peninsula, which means he's surrounded on three sides by water. And this is where the French come in. You see, Benjamin Franklin is able to get the French to agree to an alliance in perpetuity. When, the, when King Louis XIII, the last king of France, when King Louis XIII receives word that the British have been defeated at Saratoga, that's when he throws all his cards on the table. I'm going to divide these Americans. I'm going to stir up rebellion in the United States. Keep in the colonies, keep it going. And generals, troops, gold, cannon, and a navy shows up. Uh, the American Revolution had no navy. They had some privateers, but they had no navy. So the French provide ex extraordinary, extraordinary resources to the American cause. And at Yorktown, this is where I'm going to bridge it to, at Yorktown, to Cornwallis, who objected to these orders. But you see, orders our orders. And to retreat to the peninsula at Yorktown. And and Cornwallis says, I don't want to do this. I'm surrounded on three sides by water. If if the British and or the French show up, they can cut me off. I can't get out. They might be able to muster more troops than I have to break out. I don't want to retreat to a peninsula. And and the last standing British general in America in North New York says retreat to the peninsula and I will take your troops off the peninsula. I'll send the Navy down to help them escape. It doesn't happen. It doesn't happen. When the British Navy shows up to evacuate these troops on the peninsula of, of, of Yorktown, Washington has arrived. French soldiers have arrived, and a quarter of the troops under Washington were black men. That, that oftentimes is mis not remembered at all, were black soldiers. And Cornwallis has no way to get out. And Washington and the French break, uh, dig entrenching tools to get closer and closer to the main forces of, of Cornwallis. And Cornwallis attempts to surrender, but he sends out his second in command to give his flag to Washington. Washington refuses it. I want Cornwallis to surrender to me. I want it man to man. And so Cornwallis, what Washington does, he sends in one of his 
his uh, commanders to accept the flag of Cornwallis. Of Cornwallis, I am not going to accept the flag of a revolutionary. He is a traitor to the cause. So the army is marched away. The British army is marched away. Uh, meanwhile, Adams, Adams and Franklin have negotiated with the British. There is a, a surrender, and Cornwallis, Cornwallis was the best fighting general that George III had. Now, that's not the end of Cornwallis's career. He simply gets reassigned to India, you know, to keep control of that situation in India. Now, Washington, after he was elected president, the first president, and the word election is, is not correct, but we we'll use that word. When Washington is elected president, he feels it is responsibility to travel to all 13 colonies that are now states to show himself. And remember, Washington led a, an allied coalition to show himself. And after being elected president, and he brings his dog with him, and he names his dog, you guessed it, Cornwallis. Mm -hmm. But right before that, before he's elected president, uh, there's another event that Washington has to surmount. And that was when he, re not retreats, but when he returns to New York, to upstate New York, the men are angry. His officers in particular are angry. They have not been, they have not been properly paid. They have not been properly promoted in their view not properly paid, not been properly promoted, not recognized for the great sacrifices that they've made. And it's called the Newburgh Conspiracy. And Washington is there, and he knows, he knows that the officers are going to approach him and offer him the monarchy of America, that they will follow him if, if he wants to attack the Continental Congress, which is now relocated to um, Maryland, somewhere in Maryland. It'll come to me, relocated to Maryland. And he's going to disband his officers, thank them. But he gets word that they're going to approach him, I'm going to say this again, and offer them the king, to be king of America. And Washington, in his mind, is thinking, I did not fight George III to become George I of America. But he does not want to embarrass them and to chide them, to scold them. That's a good word. I like that word. To scold them for this plot, if you will. And he reads a letter. And Washington was a, a performer. Washington enjoyed the theater. And he's getting wind of this. And he said, gentlemen, and there were soldiers there as well, I'd like to read you. And he very carefully extracts a letter from his, from his coat pocket. I'd like to read you a letter that I'm going to send to the Continental Congress in which way I share your concerns and your displeasure with not being paid, you know, with not being, with not being properly promoted, you know, without being recognized for the great service that you've done to, to your country. And he reads it carefully. He reads it slowly. He was an actor. He enjoyed the theater. And he draws that letter out. Can't you see it? He draws it out carefully and he unfolds it. And it's so quiet, you can hear the paper wrinkling. It's like father to son, man to boy. And he tells them, I will share your displeasure with the Continental Congress, which I'm going to, when I leave here, you know, Newburgh, New York, to go to Annapolis. That's the capital by now, Annapolis, Maryland. And he tells them, he's at the podium, and he tells them, man to boy, father to son, look at one another. You may, not, you may never see this man again. And when you go home, do not think of yourselves as a, a New Englander, somebody from Maryland, somebody from the Carolinas, that look at yourselves as Americans. You may not see this man again, but you, my lads, you, my boys, have done a great thing. You have created a nation. You have defeated one of the mightiest empires of the 18th, 18th century. You have created a nation. You have done something no one thought you could do. So look to one another and shake hands. 
pat each other on the back. You may never see this man again. But when you return to Maryland, when you return to Carolina, think of this moment. Enjoy this moment. Embrace this moment. And then he bid them farewell. And he, Washington was a terrific writer. He galloped down to Annapolis, Maryland, and he also pulled from his breast pocket a letter. You can read the letter online, and he unfolds it. They're all listening. You know, what's he going to say? He said, I am surrendering command of the army. There's no more work left for me to do. I'm retiring. I'm surrendering my command of the army. I've done my job. And then he, mount and he took the letter and he threw it on the table. Uh, it was recently purchased by the Maryland Historical Society for a couple of million bucks. It's an original. It's one page. You can call it up online. Washington giving command of the army, turning over command. I am now a civilian. I'm not a soldier. I'm not a commander. And he walked to the door and, gall and galloped down the dr gavel driveway. And they all went to the door and they waved him off. It was the greatest exit in American history. They were weeping. They all waved him off. And he returned to, he returned home and he told Martha, I'm home to stay. My job is done. Little did he know that he would soon be elected, not once but twice, to the presidency. And a third time, if he had wished to take it. But he didn't. And in his final farewell address to the American people, which again you can read online, and I'll abbreviate it for you. You know, he tells his readers that, again, we are an American. Our future lies to the west, not to the east. The east is full of war. And that, you know, we should trade with Europe, not help them in their wars. Think of yourselves as Americans. And I go in peace. And I wish all of you to go in peace. That's Washington. Uh, you know, a man who, when he died, his Virginia neighbor, Lee, Light Horse Harry Lee, tributing a, a eulogy. And I know, I know you all know these words about Washington. First in war, first in peace, first in the hearts of his countrymen. He set the example for others to follow. And he refused a third term. Others need to replace me. I will not live forever. Others need to replace me and to learn the job of being president of the United States, not the United Colonies. See you later. I'm done. Goodbye and good luck. Mm -hmm. Okay, Rose, you can shut it All down. Right. <laughs>